Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. In this week's study, we're going to look at Yeshua's trial before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, that word simply means council. And it was the Jewish leadership, both spiritually but also governmentally. And they served under the authority of Rome. In other words, it was the Roman Empire that gave them their power. And we see something problematic. And that is that they served under that wicked empire, an empire of idolatry, one of unrighteousness. They served hand in hand. Why? Because those who were part of the Sanhedrin, they loved power. They loved controlling others and they utilized Roman authority for themselves. We learn today that that Sanhedrin, in regard to Yeshua and the trial that they had concerning him, they were utterly and thoroughly corrupt. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 26. The book of Matthew and chapter 26. Now, we left off last week with Yeshua being arrested. And now it says, look with me to verse 57, where we read, But the ones having seized Yeshua, they led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, meaning his house. Now today, if you go to Jerusalem, you can go to this very location, what is called Bet Caiaphas, the house of the high priest during the time of Yeshua's ministry. Those three, three and a half years that he served Caiaphas at the end of his ministry, he presided over the trial. So a historical place, a historical figure, which simply confirms the accuracy of the word of God. So Messiah having been arrested, he was led, he was taken to Caiaphas, the high priest. And notice what else it says in verse, verse 57. There was the scribes and the elders where they had gathered. So they knew of this plan for an arrest. They had all gathered there for this so-called trial. And the reason why I say so-called trial is that we're going to see several violations of the Sanhedrin, their own protocol. They did things not for the purpose of justice, not concerning their charter, which was to find out truth, but they had a preconceived desire, and we'll see this, to put him to death. And we're going to see in Matthew's account one glaring violation of the protocol, the rules, how the Sanhedrin governed themselves. They're going to set that aside for their ultimate objective, which was to put Messiah to death. Now, we're also going to see in the weeks to come that even though that the Sanhedrin, they felt that he was liable for death, they didn't carry it out but rather they wanted the Romans to do that. And there's great significance in that. And we'll mention that as Rome takes over this issue of what to do with Yeshua. Look now at verse 58. We see here that at that location, Bet Caiaphas, the house of Caiaphas, we see the high priests, the scribes who were biblical experts, and also the elders, those who were selected by the people as leaders. So the leadership 
was there from every capacity, every area of Jewish life. And then in verse 58, it says, kind of in contrast to these leaders, it says, but Peter, he was following him, following after Yeshua at a distance until the courtyard of the high priests. And there we read that he entered inside, and there's an emphasis here, that he entered, and then emphatically the text says, he entered inside, and he was sitting with, and this next phrase speaks about the soldiers, these individuals that were the very ones that arrested Yeshua. Now, you would think, because what he said earlier, I'm ready to die with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Others might scatter, but, but not me. Now, Peter, although he's following after that phrase at a distance, reveals fear upon his part. And then when he gathers in, and we'll see in a moment why he's there, he doesn't sit with Yeshua. He doesn't show his allegiance, his faith, his commitment to his rav, his rabbi, his, his master. But what does he do? He sits with the very ones who arrested Yeshua. In a sense, to camouflage, to hide the fact that he was a disciple. And notice what else it says. Look at the end of verse 58 where it says, to see the end. And the implication is, what would happen? How would this all end? But we already know. Yeshua has said over and over, not just to Peter, but to the disciples, that he was going to Jerusalem for Passover. It's Passover time. It's air of Passover meeting the night, the eve of the Passover. He's in Jerusalem. He said that he was going to be betrayed, and he was. We've just witnessed that last week with that kiss of Judas Iscariot that betrayed, that identified him as the one that the Sanhedrin, not the Roman Empire, but the Sanhedrin was seeking. And now here he is for this trial at the Sanhedrin, where he's going to be, it's already been determined, he's going to be condemned and with the desire to see him put to death. But it's very significant that the Sanhedrin did not put him to death, but rather it was the Roman Empire. We'll talk about the importance of that later on. But notice that last part of our verse, to see the end. Peter, he still wasn't convinced that what Yeshua said concerning what was happening, what he said was going to happen, that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be put to death. And on the third day, rise again. None of this was upon the mind of Peter. He simply wanted to know, how is this going to turn out? What will be the end? Now, verse 59. But the high priests and the elders and all the Sanhedrin, they were seeking, and it's very important that we listen carefully to this next phrase. They were seeking false testimony. Now, we need to make a distinction between this term, false testimony, and false witnesses. False witnesses relate to individuals. False testimony is something that is testified that's not true. Anyone can, can theoretically give false testimony. They can lie or they can be mistaken. But here we find that they're seeking false testimony, but in a few minutes, we're going to come across this term, false witnesses. What is a false witness? Well, in the same way that a, a kosher, an appropriate witness can, can lie or he can be mistaken, in that same way, but alternatively, we know that a false witness, they could speak the truth. A false witness doesn't mean that he's necessarily a liar. According to the Sanhedrin, Jewish law, 
a false witness is someone who is not allowed to testify before the Sanhedrin. And there's a few reasons why. One is that she is a woman. According to the Sanhedrin, women could not testify before the Sanhedrin. Why? They felt that a female could be pressured into saying something that was not correct. Secondly, Gentiles were not allowed to give testimony before the Sanhedrin. And thirdly, even Jewish men who were not Torah observant, they couldn't testify. So all of these three groups, females, Gentiles, and also Jewish men who were not Torah observant, who had not received the authority of the Torah upon their life, these individuals were all labeled false witnesses currently we're not talking about that we're being told now and let's read it very carefully look again verse 59 it says the high priest and the elders and all the sanhedrin they were seeking false testimony kata meaning against yeshua that is against jesus so that he and this is emphasized so that he they could put to death and i would underscore that because here we find their objective they're not interested in truth they're not wanting justice they don't want to find out the reality of of all that he said and why he's there and everything they have one objective so important that you see that the objective of the sanhedrin is to put Yeshua to death. Now, do not make the serious error of some and want to place that that indictment upon all Jewish people. Nothing could be further from the truth. It was a relatively small group, yea, powerful, but a small group of Jewish people who were leaders, who were in a relationship with that wicked idolatrous empire the roman empire that were there that were part of the sanhedrin and therefore we read once more they were seeking false testimony individuals now initially they wanted kosher witnesses they wanted individuals jewish men who were torah observant to come and speak against Yeshua. That is their objective. But notice what it says in verse 60, something very significant. And they did not find, meaning this. And remember the timing. This is Passover, one of the three festivals that every Jewish man above the age of 20, 20 and above, had to go up to Jerusalem. So from a standpoint of kosher witnesses, those who would be acceptable, appropriate to testify, this would have been the best time to find such a witness. But here's the problem. What the text is telling us, and this is very significant, of all those thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jewish men, Torah observant, not one, would testify against Yeshua. What does that tell us? Those who are truly submissive to the words of God, the instructions, the laws of God, are not against Yeshua. None of them would testify. Now, that fact should stand out, jump from the text. They could not find one Torah-observant Jewish man to say something against Yeshua. That's what It's saying none of them wanted to participate with their plan to put him to death. It says, and they did not find. Now keep reading in verse 60, it says, and many false witnesses. Now we're talking about individuals, those who were not able to testify. They had come, they were there, but here again, they did not find, did not find even among them And then it says, but finally, at the end, they found how many? Notice it says, but at the end, two 
false witnesses came forth and they said thus he said now here they're speaking about yeshua and these are individuals that should not be allowed to testify they are false witnesses and what happens well this is what they say they don't understand the significance the spiritual truth of what he was referring to speaking about his resurrection he spoke this in regard to the temple of his body but they didn't get that he says i am able to destroy the sanctuary of god now it's not the word temple that would be heron this is the word neon in this case it's in the the accusative case so it's neon normally it's neos so they were quoting and they said he said this one said i am able to destroy the sanctuary of god and literally it says with three days i will build it now some will say rebuilt it's not that i will build it what he's speaking about is the significance something new not a rebuilding but establishing in a new way a different way the sanctuary how one worships god this is why it's so significant it's such a spiritual statement that these individuals did not understand now that statement in and of itself would not accomplish the desire of the sanhedrin just to say if you take it how they meant it that he could destroy this building that took 46 years to build that he could destroy it and in three days build it now that might make if you take it literally referring to the building itself that might make him crazy in some people's mind of course messiah could do all things but the point here is this in and of itself wouldn't accomplish this was the only testimony that was given that he said something from a human standpoint not understanding the spiritual significance that seemed uh, outrageous but let me ask you a question would that carry out their desire to put him to death did they have any witness testimony that said anything truly incriminating against him the answer is no they did not therefore they were not succeeding in their objective we already learned what it was that they would put him to death they violated they allowed two false witnesses that should not be speaking they're forbidden to give testimony they allowed it in order to accomplish their objective but here again they failed and that's why we read look now to verse 62 this is why it says out of desperation is the context we read in verse 62 and the high priest this is of course caiaphas he stood up and he said to him you nothing answer you don't respond well the one on trial did not have to speak he could remain silent it was through the testimony of others and there had to be at least two or three and if it's more than three hear them all they had nothing whatsoever so again the high priest in order to try to manipulate the situation he stands up and he begins to speak and he wants to hear something from yeshua that he could twist that he could use against him so he says you remain silent you don't answer anything on what look at the middle of verse verse 62 what these testify against you and it says verse 63 but yeshua he was silent now this word for being silent is in the imperfect what did we learn about that well frequently the imperfect tense is used speaking about a situation that that began in the past he had been silent for a while and he's currently silent but the imperfect foreshadows a change meaning he had been silent up until now but we can anticipate in a moment 
that he's going to speak. That's the significance of the imperfect. And therefore, look at the second part of verse 63. And the high priest answered and said to him, and this is a word which means, I implore you, literally, I, I require you to take an oath. Now, Yeshua could have been silent still, but this is a, a phrase of desperation. He wants some response from Yeshua. And therefore, notice what he asks. He says, I adjure you, implore you, take an oath according to the living God. And he says, in order that us, you tell if you are the Messiah. And here again, a very important statement in the new covenant. Here's the high priest, the primary leader. Now, we know something. Priests had many responsibilities, one of which, and sometimes we forget this, one of the responsibilities of the priests were to be teachers, to instruct the children of Israel in the truth of God. And therefore, this one says, I implore you, do not remain silent, but tell me, are you the Messiah? And notice what he says, not just the Messiah, but he continued and said, the, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, this tells us something, that it was known 2,000 years ago, Judaism wants to hide this fact, deny it. But the fact is, 2,000 years ago, they understood that the Messiah was the Son of the living God, meaning he is divine. Today, they totally reject that notion, but 2,000 years ago, they understood it as a fact. So he says, in order that you tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of, of God. And Yeshua says to him, you have said, meaning this is true, so he does not deny that he's the Messiah, nor does he deny that he is divine when he says the Son of God. But notice he continues. He affirms that, but he also continues and says something so significant. But I say to you, from now on, meaning from now and further, you shall see the Son of Man. So now we have a statement of his divinity, and now we have a statement of his humanity, Yeshua being fully man, fully God. That's what the scripture reveals. Anyone who denies the divinity of Messiah is a false teacher. And the divinity of Messiah implies the Trinity. So if you deny the Trinity, you're not a believer. You're not saved. You don't know the true identity of the Savior. And unless you identify him correctly as the Son of God, you can't be saved. So Yeshua says, from now on, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. This is another fact concerning his divinity and coming upon the clouds of heaven. Now, here, you may not know it, but Yeshua is quoting scripture from the book of Daniel and Daniel chapter 7. There it speaks, it begins in verse 12 and 13. It speaks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Before who? Before the Ancient of Days, which is a term for God, God the Father. And what does it speak of? Well, if you keep reading, it says that the Son of Man is going to receive from God the Father. He is going to inherit to the extent that all glory and power and honor and, and, and worship is going to be given to him. Now, it's important here because this word, which relates to worship, is in Aramaic. If it was a Hebrew word, the Hebrew word, lavod, could mean serve in a general sense or worship. Both are possible. But by the providence of God, it is not written down in Hebrew. It's Aramaic. And this word in the book of Daniel and in Aramaic in general, it implies worship in a spiritual sense. 
So this affirms that Messiah is worthy to be worshiped, meaning he is the son of God. That's why Yeshua quoted that. And notice what happens, verse 65. Then the high priest tore his garment, saying that he has blasphemy. And then he turns to the group in the middle of verse 65 and says, what still need do we have of witness, of testimony, of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. And what do you think, verse 66, meaning what is your ruling? And they were answering and they said, having death, he is, meaning he is liable for the death penalty. And what is this? Well, this is a rush of judgment in order to accomplish their objective, which is to be able to take an indictment of the death penalty before Rome. But you know what? They never wanted to tell that because they knew, based upon their own evidence, Rome would not put him to death. That he had done nothing. In fact, Rome tells them, and we'll see this, you put him to death. That's what Pontius Pilate's going to say. But they did not want to do that. Why? They wanted his death to be a discouragement of all the people, all of his followers, saying, if you do this, if you follow him, if you believe his teaching, then you're going to be crucified as well. There's another reason, and that it, it was only the Romans who crucified. And because the Torah, remember how frequently it speaks about the scripture being fulfilled. The scripture says in Deuteronomy, cursed is the one who is hung on the tree. And that Torah fact, cursed is the one who hangs on the tree, speaks about the fact that he died and he received the curse of what? the violations of the law because of sin, our sin, he suffered the penalty. So they say he's worthy of death. And then what happens? Look at the end. They spat in his face. They struck him and they slapped, saying, prophesy to us, Messiah, who it is that hits you. All of this speaks about how they mocked him. And who was he? The son of God, the one who came to express the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God. And what did they do? They mocked him, spat on him, slapped him, hit him. Why? It's an indictment against their knowledge of prophetic truth. Prophecy positions us to understand the work of God. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.